Whoa. Let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are holy. Lord, that we can praise you. That we can celebrate who you are. Lord, thank you that even in the storms of this life and in our trials, we can still praise you. Because you are still good. We can still find hope in you, even when there seems at times that there is none. And Lord, as, as we delve into your word today, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. Help us to find even greater joy in, in who you are. Help us to celebrate the wonder of who you are in even greater measure, we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. Wow. Yeah, thank you guys. And thanks, Dorothy, for sharing that. It's really powerful. Um, oh, uh, welcome to Trinity Church. It's, it's a joy to have you here. If uh, you're watching on the live stream, I'm not sure if we've made it quite there yet. It's, have we? Yes, if you're watching on the live stream, welcome. It's great to have you as well. Uh, it's, it's kind of hard to transition out of a worshipful moment like that. You know, sometimes uh, it's, it's, it's easier if there's <laughs> if, it, if it kind of ends and there's this awkward silence, because then, you know, we've got somewhere to take it. But when the presence of God is with us, it's, it's hard to, to move on with kind of a light-hearted intro, which is kind of what I had in mind. And uh, you just know that God is, God is here, and that's exciting. Um, a quick, quick announcement, just as a side note. Um, we do this thing called Zoom prayer on Mondays and Fridays. Um, now, I have a confession to make. I might have made things a little bit confusing this week. So something's happening, which is really good. We're getting lots of visitors to our website. Praise the Lord. Great news. The, the thing that's not so good is that I put a link up there for us called Zoom Prayer, and it took you directly to the Zoom link. So I've been getting emails most days from random people who just wanted to check out what Zoom Prayer was and ended up on our Zoom meeting, and an email saying, so-and-so from Edmonton, so-and-so from Silver Lake, so-and-so from Saskatchewan is waiting on Zoom prayer. And so I moved that link. But in moving that link, uh, it made it maybe less than easy for other people to find it. I didn't realize people were clicking on that link. So the link, Sheree, could you bring it back up again? Um, and for those of you on the stream, the link is uh, trinityreddeer.ca. That's our website, trinityreddeer.ca forward slash Zoom prayer. If you type that into your, your website browser, it will take you straight, it will, it will open up Zoom for you so you can get on there. So just so you know, if you want to join us on Mondays and Fridays from 7.15 to 7.35, then you can. Don. Uh, that's it. We don't have any way of doing that at the moment, but we, you could join us and we could pray for you. Or you could let me know and we could pray for you. Um, yeah. So Don is asking, again, for the benefit of those watching, if we could have a, a way of kind of asking for prayer requests and stuff, which is a brilliant idea. I will work on it. I'll find a solution, and we'll, we'll make that happen. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So to summarize, uh, for those who maybe didn't hear Dwayne, uh, that we, it's primarily for praying for the church through the body. Um, but if you have individual prayers, of course, it's a great place to pray as well. It's just not the primary focus. The focus is on uh, us praying for the church, that the church would grow and that we'd see God's kingdom come through the church. So with all that said and done, uh, for those of you who maybe don't know me quite so well yet, uh, one thing you hopefully will know or you should know is that I love rugby. I love rugby. Now, I need to tell you that I think rugby might be the best sport in the world. And I do need to tell you as well that I think it's better than hockey. So yeah, I'm just going just gonna to throw that bomb out there. I'll just tell you that it's... it's, it's, it's I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's... <laughs> yes, good. Wait, yeah. So there's, people are saying they'll pray for me on Zoom prayer. Great. 
Uh, that's what it takes. But I think rugby is the best sport in the world. I love it. It's attritional. There's none of this namby-pamby helmets and armor and any of that stuff. It's like, no, it's for real men. You're going you're to play. You're going to take each other. You're going to put your bodies on the line. I love it. One of my best experiences ever in life has been on the rugby field when I was about 14 years old. Uh, it was really profound, actually. I was, I was playing for Bracknell Rugby Club. Of course, you've all heard of Bracknell Rugby Club. Uh, and I, we were playing Windsor Rugby Club. Now, you might have heard of Windsor because that's where uh, the Queen's Castle is. Uh, one of what the Queen's Castles is at Windsor, and it's famous for that. And so for me, it was quite a cool thing to be playing against Windsor. And we uh, turned up to this backfield, which felt like it was in the middle of nowhere, until you turned round and you saw on the horizon the Queen's Castle. Now that's quite a cool thing in itself to be like, I'm playing rugby and the queen might be looking out of her window and see me. <laughs> now, that's a 14-year-old thinking, not the realistic 31-year-old uh, now, but I thought, who knows? And it was Remembrance Sunday as well. And so at 11 o'clock, normally we were due to, to kick off, to get started, but we all lined up, 33 of us or so, lined up on the halfway line and faced towards the castle. And we had a moment or two minutes of silence to remember the people that had fallen in, in war. Now, when you're a 14-year-old about to put your body on the line, and you know, that, that really is that culture in rugby. It's like you put your body on the line. You are ready to go to battle for your, your friends, for your teammates. And you are stood there reflecting on the sacrifice that people made for you. Oh, boy, you get a sense of the poignancy of, of war. It's just a, a touch. And the other thing as well that kind of happened is that as we lined up, for some reason rugby players always do this. I don't know if it's the same in football, but you... You have to show that you mean business, you have to have your hands just above your knees and bend a little bit. So you're facing the other team and you're like, yep, this is how people know that I am ready to go. I'm ready to, to fight. And as I was there, the rain started pouring down. Now, if you ever want to be ready for a battle, playing rugby in the rain, having just had two minutes silence, remembering people who went for war for your freedom, whoa, I was fired up. I, I, think, I don't know if the people across the way knew what hit them, but I was ready to go. And for me, that's a small taste, and I want to emphasize this. It's such a small taste of the physical reality of war. But I was so ready to, uh, to just do whatever it took to get victory for my friends. By the way, we won like 70 nil, so, you know, it went well. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Scored a hat trick, but, you know, we don't want to dwell on that. Don't want to dwell on that. Uh, so it was a big deal. It was a, it was a big deal, and it was a small taster of what physical war looked like. Now, the reality is... Very few, if any of us, have experienced the physical realities of war, have we? we it's a good thing. Praise the Lord that that's the case. Maybe we know people that have. Uh, I, thankfully, I don't. But the thing is, we are in a war. Did you know that? We are in a war. Every moment of every day, we are in the war. I call it the war of this world. It's the war of good versus evil. And you've probably experienced some of that war if you've ever... Uh, been tempted to, uh, to say something you shouldn't or to maybe to steal or to lie or to watch something you shouldn't or to drink something or take or like uh, do drugs or do all those things, all those things that you know you shouldn't do. If you end up finding yourself dishonoring God and you know that you're taking a step to dishonor God, then you found yourself in the war of this world. You see, our, our minds are fertile battlegrounds on the war of this world world. We're constantly fighting battles in the war of this world. It's the, the fight of good versus evil, and our enemy in this war is sin. The, our enemy in this war is, is evil. It's Satan sometimes. It's the forces of evil, and we are constantly fighting that every moment of every day. Now, the question is, how do we fight in the war of this world? How do we stand <laughs> Maybe not like this when you're playing, ready to play rugby, but how do you stand ready to fight in the war of this world, ready to, to gain victory in the war of this world? Well, I believe that as we continue our series on First Peter today, uh, we're in chapter 4, so if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn there now. Uh, I believe in this passage we get some answers as to how we can fight the war of this world, how we can stand up and be ready to put our bodies on the line, uh, maybe physically speaking, but maybe uh, generally speaking, how do we do that for the kingdom of God? So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to read from uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to read 1 to, uh, 1 to 6. It's going to appear on the screen just here as well. I'm reading from the ESV version, if it's uh, different to yours. It says this, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. 
For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Now let's Let's dig into that passage a little bit. You know, Peter has this, this habit. If you're, you're new to joining us, we've been working through the, the book of First Peter, and we've seen the same thing come up again and again and again. He has this really great habit that we should mimic of pointing to Jesus. In everything that he says, he's pointing to Jesus. That's, that's pretty, it's a good thing that we could learn from. He says, hey, because of the gospel, because of the good news of Jesus, do this. Hey, this might be the case, but because of Jesus, this is the case. And because of this, this. And it's no different here. Uh, Shreya has put it on the screen here. Uh, his argument is, is quite straightforward. You know, there's a reality that I want to admit, I want to confess that when I hear people reading a passage of Scripture, honestly, and this is, this is someone who's uh, trained in Bible school and is, is supposed to be, you know, very focused on this stuff, I get to verse 1, I kind of zone out for a bit, then I'll kind of tune in maybe a few verses later, and I'm missing what's going on. And if you're anything like me, I hope you're not, uh, but my attention tends to wander. And then I think, what was going on? There's all that stuff that was said in those six verses, uh, or you know, in, in a large passage. I think we did 12 verses last week, didn't we? And uh, I want to tell you that the, the actual argument, as confusing as it may seem when you first hear it, is, is simple. It's, hey, because of this, do that, and then here's why. I'm going to explain why. Because of this, do that, here's why. So the question is... What's this? What's that? And why are we doing any of it? That's, that's what we're going to look at today. That's kind of how we're working through this passage. So, what is this? Which is a weird thing to say. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. That's the this. Because Christ suffered in the flesh. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. Let's pause there, because that's a big deal. Now, some people might question whether Christ suffered in the flesh, but most scholars, in fact, the vast majority, atheist or uh, Christian or whatever, would say Jesus lived and he suffered in the flesh. That's an indisputable fact. Uh, Very few people could argue and could present any kind of coherent argument to say that. The question would be, was he the son of God and did he rise again and did he ascend to to be with uh, his father in heaven? Well, I believe with every fiber of my being that he did, and I, I think many of you do as well, Jesus suffered in the flesh. And it's a much bigger thing than just saying, hey, like, he, he hurt himself, you know, because we were locked in sin, because of this uh, war, because of the war of this world where our minds can't help but be battlegrounds for our sinful natures, we talked about that, because of that, God sent his one and only son to die for us, to take the punishment that we deserved, to pay the debt that we couldn't pay, and to die on a cross for us, and to rise again victorious over sin and death, and uh, to ascend to the right hand of the Father, so that if we choose to believe in him, we will not perish, we will not have eternal death, but we have eternal life. So when we say, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, we're saying, no, no, because of the gospel, because of this, because of the good news of Jesus, that's the this. So then what? What do we do? Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, Whoa, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking as, as Christ. That's a tough thing. And, and when we think of arm, you know, it has a different connotation in the original language. It, it's, it's more like you know, putting on your armor ready for battle. It's not just, oh, oh hey, I've got, I've got a stick ready to go. I'm not, you know, it's, no, it's like I'm getting ready for battle. So and you imagine that in, in Roman times, you know, uh, you're in your camp knowing that today you're going to battle. You're, you're putting your metal armor on. You're, you're fastening it. You're maybe sat on a tree stump tying up your sandals and the people that you're with, it might be the last time you ever see them. It's intense. That's a solemn occasion because you know you are going to war. Now, we are not putting on physical armor, but we are going to war. We are arming ourselves, not with physical things, but we are arming ourselves with the way of thinking of Jesus. Now, the question is, what does that mean? What does it mean to arm ourselves with the way of thinking of Christ Jesus? And that's the here's why bit. So because Christ suffered in the flesh, arm ourselves with the same way of thinking as him. Well, we're going to explain it and say why. That's what Peter's doing here. So he says, 
For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Okay, so we've got to arm our way ourselves with the same way of thinking because whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Well, that's okay. We've talked about martyrdom and we've talked about people being persecuted in, in the past. Uh, in the, like a few weeks ago, I know I talked about it, but I'm not. Like sometimes I get ridiculed. Like my family will sometimes make fun of me, sometimes, but not much. And like, it's, I, d- I haven't suffered in the flesh. I haven't been flogged. I haven't been imprisoned. I haven't been martyred, as you can tell. I obviously, haven't been. And so, what does, what does that mean to suffer in the flesh? I, I haven't suffered in the flesh. So, does that mean that I haven't ceased from sin? That's the question we need to ask. Well, I think we need to take a step to Romans 6. So in, in Romans 6, don't, don't worry about turning there. You can if you want to, but it's going to appear on the screen. Romans 6, verses 6 to 7 says this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Okay, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. In other words... We gain, uh, we gain something when we choose to follow Jesus. We are no longer slaves to sin. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2.16 says that we have the mind of Christ when we choose to follow Jesus. So at the, moment, at the moment we choose to follow him, we gain the mind of Christ. So that we, we gain that way of thinking. Now we have to arm ourselves with it. And so we are declared free from sin. So this thing happens. And this is, this is uh, I find it's quite confusing. So if, uh, I still do sometimes. So you... It's this thing that you're declared free from sin because of what Jesus did. Okay, so you're in a legal sense, you you deserved a punishment and you were declared free from sin. That's great. But the thing is, I don't know about you, but I keep sinning. Well, that's a that's a challenge. So I am free from sin and yet I continue to sin. What's what's the deal there? Well, there's this process called sanctification where we are becoming what we have already been declared to be. Does that make sense? So we have been declared free from sin, but there's still a bit of sin, and we are becoming what we've been declared to be. It's a process called sanctification. We are working towards becoming holy. Now, there's, a, there's two parts to that. There's an, an aspect where God works that into our lives, and there's an aspect where we have a, a responsibility to make ourselves holy. Now, it's primarily God. Uh, God is the one who uh, frees us from the slavery to, to sin. But that's the deal here. So, it's, so when we say, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, there's something that happens. God, Jesus has suffered in the flesh, and we take that suffering on, on our, like he takes that suffering on our behalf. So we can say, yeah, we've suffered in the flesh as well. So therefore, we've ceased from sin because he was doing it on our behalf. Does that make sense? But we've been declared free from sin, and yet there's this process where we are becoming what we've been declared to be. So we are working the rest of the sin, the remnant of sin, out of our life. Okay? So that is why there's still another explanation. That's why we carry on talking about what's going on. Because you know, in this verse, you might have noticed, he says, well, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Okay, <laughs> so we've, we've suffered in the flesh and we've ceased from sin, but we still sometimes live for human passions and, and not, the, not the will of God. So it's that process. We're working that process of becoming what we have been declared to be. Now there's this, this problem. Human passions versus the will of God. That is, that's it. In a nutshell, that is the war of this world. It's human passions versus the will of God. Now, there's a challenge here because Jesus trusted in the will of God and we sometimes don't. And in, you know, the thing is when we, when we sin, when we do anything that's outside of the will of God, that is exactly what sin is. Like, we are sinning when we choose to do anything that is outside of God's perfect and good and holy will. And the thing is, we mess up. We, we miss out when, when that's the case. You know, Jesus suffered in the flesh for us. We heard that at the beginning of the passage. Why did he do that? He did it because he knew and he trusted in the will of God. Jesus knew and trusted in the will of God. He was able to say, hey, Lord, not as I will, but as you will. I want to go your way, not my way. 
And that's an example that, that we're to follow. We're, to call, we're called to trust in the will of God. And so I want to tell you today that our, our strongest weapon in the war of this world is to know and trust in the will of God. Our strongest weapon in the war of this world is knowing and trusting in the will of God. By doing that alone, we can fight the war of this world in a huge way. Knowing and trusting that God's ways are good and righteous and holy, that's the way that we are called to go. You know, and if we are suffering, we've talked about suffering for doing good. If we are, if we are personally suffering in the flesh, well, I think that's an indicator that someone is knowing and trusting in the will of God. If they're willing to put their lives on the lines for the will of God, that's a pretty good indicator. If you're willing to stand up for your faith, if you're willing to endure persecution and rejection and all the things that come with it, well, that's a pretty good indicator that you're knowing and trusting in the will of God. Is it the only way to show that you know and trust the will of God? Absolutely not. But it's a, a pretty good indicator. Let's carry on. Verse 3 here. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality and passions and drunkenness and orgies and drinking parties and lawless idolatry. What is he saying? Well, enough's enough. Guys, if, if you believe in Jesus, if you've chosen to become a follower of Jesus, a line needs to be drawn in the sand. We are in a war and you can't have your feet in both camps. It doesn't work like that. You are one or the other. You are either for God or you are against God. Every action, everything that you ever do is either for God or it's against God. And we often think in broad terms, we're like, oh, broadly, I'm, I'm for God. You know, broadly, I'm, I'm kind of going in that direction. But we let ourselves be against God in so many of the smaller things that we do. And that's challenging. It's really challenging. It's challenging to show that, to show that we are for God in every action that we, we take. I, I read a really interesting kind of thought experiment the other day. Uh, they said something along these lines. Imagine if there were no Bibles, but the Christian faith was still the Christian faith. And imagine if for three months people observed you as the the measure of what the Christian faith is, the measure of the Bible. And so your actions were the only thing people had. And then after three months, they were given a Bible. And they were allowed to study the Bible and see how it matched up. How do you think your life would match up? How do you think your life would teach people about the Bible? <laughs> For me, that's pretty convicting because I think I'm missing out on a few things. And, you know, that I'm, I'm so caught up sometimes in and temptations and desires to do things that are not of God. I want to go my own way. I'm, I'm, I want to pursue human passions. I want to do what's fun. And sometimes, sometimes it, feels like, it feels like serving God isn't fun. Sometimes it feels that way. And usually it's because my mindset is wrong. It's usually because I'm missing something of the goodness of God. And because uh, I have this short-termist mindset that is missing the beauty of God in the, the broader picture. And... You know, if you're anything like me, there's a continual battle in the mind, and it can get tiring. We can get tired <laughs> of these continual battles on these, this mind, oh, mind field. There you go. That's a good pun. No, no, I thought it was funny. Anyway, Joan of Arc says this. She says, battles are won and lost in the mind, and that's so true. <laughs> she was a warrior. She was a physical warrior, but still, you know, we, we, we're called to find our hope in Jesus, not in uh, careers or sports or drugs or sex or money or <laughs> whatever. Our hope, the, the living hope worth living for that we're talking about is, is in Jesus alone. He's, he is what it's all about. And that doesn't mean it's easy. Of course it doesn't. Sometimes it can be really hard. We've talked about that. Sometimes we might experience suffering. In fact, Peter kind of alludes to this. He says, respect, with respect to all these things that uh, he mentioned before, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. In other words, they, we might experience a hard time from people when we don't live the way that the world lives. We're called to live separately from the, 